Hello and welcome to uh, Illuminating Immunity Virtual Summit. I'm your host, Dr. Joe DeDuro. My guest today is James Carroll. He has over 30 years of photobiomodulation experience. He's the founder and CEO of the industry-leading company, Thor Photomedicine. He's collaborated with the foremost photobiomodulation academics, co-authored 22 PBM papers, contributed chapters to five books. He's recognized as an authority on PBM dose, dose rates, the measurements, and reporting parameters. He has recently, recently been named the Academy of Laser Dentistry's 2020 TH Maiman Award winner, presented to individuals that have demonstrated excellence in dental laser research. This is, the award is named in honor of Theodore H. Maiman, the developer of the world's first laser in 1960. And here we are 60 years later with uh, James Carroll, and he's going to talk about the, the, poss the five possible therapeutic opportunities for PBM versus COVID. And uh, you've been working on this thing for a while. You've been thinking about this for a while, James? Yes, we have. And it, what came to your mind? These, did, did all these possible therapeutic, therapeutic opportunities come at once, or did it develop as you were continuing your research? You know, I've, since day one, since 1987, uh, I felt that this therapy you know, having seen what it did in wound healing, I've, when I attended my first conference, um, you know, the sons of Andre Mester were there, um, and uh, uh, Mary Dyson, former editor of Grey's Anatomy, her lab, listening to talks about wound healing. I thought this therapy would be in every corner of every department in every hospital in the whole world within five years, but I didn't know anything about the how difficult. Uh, medicine was to um, to traverse. So um, that's born out of ignorance, and the and the the goalposts seem to be moving away the closer we get to it, you know. Uh, unfortunately, so I wasn't thinking. Even though I remember Mary Dyson talking about uh, not talking about immunity as much, such, but she talked about immune responses uh, to infection. I remember the early phases of wound healing how she would report on there being more neutrophils and lymphocytes in the, uh, in the wounds uh, that receive PBM versus those on the control group. And of course, in the early days, I'm just thinking wound healing and later we get into musculoskeletal pain. Um, and that became the focus of PBM for many years and then sort of neuropathic pain and post-operative pain and gradually. So COVID-19 was not even on my radar, maybe nobody else's, apart from people who obviously predicted pandemics and have recognized they've been around for uh, for centuries. Um, so, uh, of course, it took a pandemic before I was thinking seriously about, you know, as a priority, mm. I would perhaps knew that perhaps this might help. And obviously there's a contradiction with, um, uh, with PBM. It's because uh, you think like, hey, I want more immune cells to go and do their job. Uh, but the problem, if you if you were to say to anybody, um, an immunologist, hey, guess what? This this increases the number of lymphocytes and neutrophils um, after treatment. You really might think, well, hey, we don't want that. You know, when we've got a patient who's in perhaps critical stages of uh, of COVID nineteen, and they've got too many cytokines, and you don't want too many of these monocytes, monocytes and macrophages, and you know, this is not the time for neutrophils necessarily, and and things. You don't want an overactive innate immune response. Uh, so, what are you talking about? You know. So, um, uh, but those of us who do PBM and have obviously treated ourselves, friends, family, or and if you're a doctor, you've treated patients, knows that this is a this is an odd therapy in that it seems to be. Uh, we like to say it's um, it's it's it, it improves homeostasis. Um, and so when we say PBM increases this cell type or reduces this cell type, well, it's in very specific circumstances right. in certain phases of an injury or a disease. And so this is actually quite, to people who are not familiar with it, this is a, when we say it does more of this or less of that, um, it's disease and timing specific, Correct. these things. And, um, and I, I haven't got, um, and other than saying it seems to improve homeostasis. Well, you know, Paul Chizot was talking about the accelerator and the brake and what is the timing of this. But I could just say that, you know, when you're looking at the 
the, the, the outcomes of all the various studies, and I'm sure you're going to review them in these five, you know, potential aspects and that I, you know, you're just seeing you know, CPK, CPK, all these things, IL-6, all these things that you see in, in the majority mm. of the PBM research. Wow. Then it's all coming up in the, in the, in the COVID research. Mm. So like I was like, somebody tell me how this connects, you know, mm. That's why we kind of put the summit on because we were start, as you remember, we were starting to do the brain summit and everybody wanted to talk about COVID. And I said, well, let's just do another COVID one afterwards so we can, kind of put put this knowledge in one place okay yeah well that's why i'm here with my with my version the dog and uh, pony what might be possible uh, anything you want to put, point out again before we uh, go to the slides uh, no i think the slides and i use slides really and um, it's not going to be exhaustive uh topic i just enough to sort of just to get us into each of the what i consider the five possible arenas uh, for PBM. Okay, so let's go to the slides. Let's see. The five possible PBM opportunities for COVID-19. Right. Well, for better English would be the five possible... I oh, know, maybe that's as good as I can get it. All right, so first of all, disclosure. Uh, as Joe said, I'm founder CEO of Thor. Uh, so I pay myself salary, I've got shares, I get paid expenses, I've co-founded another light therapy company called Lumathera, so all of that means that I'm extremely biased and you can't believe anything I'm going to tell you today. I started my life as an engineer designing radio stations, I'm not a scientist or a doctor. Uh, but I have been doing this a long time, as you said, uh, been doing this since 1987, it's 33 years now. Uh, I've co-authored 22 academic papers on this subject, six of them at Harvard. I've helped them write four. It's now a fifth book. Uh, my expertise is on dose and beam parameters. My expertise, uh, my, I've been an expert reviewer for the journals that publish most of the work in this field. And I've, I'm a co-chair of the Biomedical Optics Society Conference on Photobiomodulation Mechanisms. And I've joined a couple of uh, interesting clubs down here. Um, so... Just to give you a sense of this, what I do when we're not uh, making lasers, well, we're always making lasers, but um, we've got a lot of collaboration. We've, we do work with uh, Harvard School of Public Health. We're working on noise-induced hearing loss. And this might be particularly of interest to people who've actually new to PBM. I, I expect the audience that they're here knows we don't need to tell them what PBM is, but they might bring along a few friends at some point, say, hey, you must watch this. So I will just... For those people not familiar, you might just learn a bit from this slide about how diverse it is. Um, and again, just for those people, just in case you're somebody who's being dragged here against your will to listen to some ravings about light and COVID-19, what is PBM? PBM is something you've seen on Star Trek, you know, the TV show and the movies. On Star Trek, when somebody's injured and they go to the sick bay, the doctor gets out a laser beam, aims the laser at the injury, and the injury heals instantly. You know, the tissues just regenerate. And that is PBM. Now, it's not as fast as on TV. We get the idea. We shine light on people. They get better more quickly. And it's a real thing. And we're not going to go through all the validation of that uh, today, but it turns out it also has some effects on um, it's sort of immunomodulatory. Anyway, so for example, Harvard School of Public Health, uh, we work on noise-induced hearing loss. We've shown we can grow cells in the lab and we can re regenerate cochlear hair cells. And we're now, gonna, we're now trying to the mice with a goal to actually treating it, uh, treating sailors in the United States Navy. Brigham Women's Hospital, children who have cancer need bone marrow transplants and they get horrible side effects and we're treating those. Um, and we're working with uh, them to do a large multi-center clinical trial. At MGH, Massachusetts General Hospital, we're working on the leading cause of uh, death and disability of children and young adults in the developed world, which is Joe's previous uh, subject, which was, well, brain injury, or just generally treating the brain was the last one, wasn't it? It was across right. a wide range of applications. But at MGH, we worked on mice and rats, looking at the mechanism of action and dose response. And at the VA, the American uh, military hospital system, we're actually treating patients. And at Cornell, uh, we look at cancer safety. Some people worry, does this grow tumors? proliferate cancer cells or does it shrink them or have no effect at all there's a dose response in this therapy and we've been looking at that at NYU and charting that for cancer therapy side effects 
more cancer therapy side effect research with Hong Kong University. There's so many side effects, uh, inflammatory side effects from radiation and chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. It stops your saliva glands from working, and you get these radiation burns. Effectively, it looks like that anyway. These are these um, a radiation-induced um, skin reaction, a form of dermatitis, sports injuries here in Brazil, um, University of Barcelona Dental School, St Jude's in the United States, world's leading research centre for catastrophic diseases. Again, side effects of high-dose chemotherapy and radiotherapy. Just to give you a slight taste between uh, the uh, Israeli army working on knee pain, uh, more cancer therapy side effects, memorial sun Kettering and at Nova, chemotherapy induced peripheral neuropathies, acute myocardial infarction in Tel Aviv, and so on. And in our National Health Service, we just finished an eight center clinical trial, uh, head and neck cancer patients treating the side effects of the radiation. There's a huge list, and this is just to start really I'll give you if you're not familiar with an insight and now we're in 55 different institutions around the world um collaborating on various things uh, the white thing as the yellow ones are all cancer related and all the pink ones are uh, sort of sport related and various other things in white text so there's a lot of work going on in the field so first of all covid19 before you get too excited there's no clinical trial evidence okay um, and I just want to highlight that I'm not going to talk about the direct antimicrobial effects of light. It is well known that ultraviolet light kills bugs. It's a, used as a form of sterilization for instruments and for rooms. So there are wavelengths of light that will directly kill bacteria, viruses, fungal spores, that kind of thing. And I'm not talking about that. People do sometimes think it's PBM and it's not PBM. Antimicrobial light is a different therapy. Uh, even though PBM does, and we will talk about, has some effect on immunity, may help your immune system deal with bacteria, viruses, and fungal infections. Um, that might be PBM, but these antimicrobial effects, it's not what I'm talking about and it's not really PBM. Uh, and I must say, immunities, I've written it carefully, script for myself, immunity is a highly specialized complex subject and I'm not competent or qualified to advise on those matters. Uh, but I do have a long history in photobiomodulation and probably the most extensive research database on the subject. So I can pose some questions for immunologists to speculate and talk about the little bit of evidence, uh, relevant data that is available to them. And really wouldn't mind sparking some interest. Um, so the five possible opportunities I think are before you're infected, after you're infected, and particularly the severe cases, and obviously some people have few symptoms and it comes and it goes, um, and some none at all. But I'm talking about, I'm gonna be talking about hospitalized cases, and then hospitalized cases who progress to ICU, uh, and then people, a lot of people taking a long time to recover from this, uh, and then um, what might it do to help uh, the production of antibodies? That's my short slide version. So boosting innate immunity. So apparently there's your innate immunity. That means that's your, what you can have a, a new virus, bacteria, or fungal infection you've never seen before, and your innate immune system tries its best to deal with it because it doesn't recognize the infection. So, so you think that neutrophils and lymphocytes to go after those. Uh, so what have we got about PBM and uh, the innate in, uh, immune system? Not a lot, uh, disappointing really. Um, neutrophils are really the first response against uh, a coronavirus infection, according to the reading I've been done. Um, but these neutrophils can also contribute to the pathology in the sort of a later phases of the disease. Uh, um, and it turns out that we're going to talk about the later phases in the next section, really. Um, but so I'll come back to that. Um, neutrophil activation via oh, typo is via PBM to bone marrow. So yes, your neutrophils are made in your bone marrow, and uh, putting laser beams and other intense light sources, uh, your bone is sort of translucent. Uh, traditionally, in say traditionally, like it's done all the time, but experimentally, it has been shown in human clinical trials or a human clinical trial that when you put light into the tibia so your shins um why the shins because there's not much meat in the way you don't have muscle in the way and it's easy to get light the bone is translucent you can get light into bone marrow 
In other clinical trials, it's been shown that it causes mobilization of um, mesenchymal stem cells that just float around the body and do interesting things, which we might come back to later on. It's been shown in acute myocardial infarction to re uh, reduce some of the markers of a heart attack in human clinical trials. It was shown in rats, then pigs, uh, and uh, healthy humans, and now actual uh, patients in Tel Aviv. So that's interesting. Well, putting light into bone marrow does something in humans. This is a, a mouse study. You see a bit of a slide of a bit of a, a graph of on the right-hand side there. Um, and it not only seemed to release and increase the number of these neutrophils, uh, but it seemed to induce a higher fungicidal activity. And there, so you see on the the laser treated. Now these these uh, these mice were infected with something called Paracoxidioides brasilianus. It's a fungal infection that uh, that uh, Brazilian farmer, coffee farmers can get uh, in their lungs. This is a mouse model of that. They infect the mice, they give them the laser treatment, and you see uh, less or fewer uh, of these um, spores in the uh, in the mouse in the uh, in the treated mice compared with controls. It wasn't enough to completely eradicate the infection, uh, but still helpful. And this is. All right, I'm talking about a fungal infection here. It's not a virus, but it's, I'm really thinking here about the act of a release or mobilization and activation of neut neutrophils. The only thing we've got that I, that I can see, which is, shows some kind of innate immune, improved innate immune response. Um, yes, it's always, yes, we, we're extrapolating from a mouse to here, but it's all we've got that I know of. Uh, Nothing I found in humans. Um, they, they say that there's a possible stimulation of acquired immune response as well. So that hopefully means antibodies, which we'll talk about later on. Um, and they found apparently this increased yield of proteins involved, which suggests an acquired immune response has been improved by this treatment. Mm. So there's a, an innate immune response possible. Might there be others? Um, this is the only time I've seen something where it shows neutrophil increase and then an infection for it to go after. It's the only one that comes to my mind. Um, so that's the innate immunity. Um, now preventing, once you, if you've got, if you've developed, uh, now one of my thoughts, by the way, just to criticize my own previous slide, uh, apart from the fact that we're extrapolating from mice to humans, uh, is that, um, uh, do you really want to spend your entire life with lots and lots of neutrophils whizzing around your body, perhaps slightly activated when you don't have an infection? You know, um, you know, they, uh, could that be toxic for you? You know, that's one for the, um, I bet that when the, any immunologist sees that, they say, yeah, you know what, you probably, you know, the, the human body is amazing at keeping itself in balance. And then it might not always be that you want to, Perhaps we shouldn't be allowed to control our immune system because it directly, because um, James, James, calm. one thing that we talk about is when you, you know, you talked about homeostasis and yes. that innate immunity. Yes. One of the things that, you know, chiropractors used to talk about was an innate intelligence. That was the mm. thing that maintained the homeostasis. So, mm. you know, uh, that's something that it's, again, the complexity is, is, is large. So, I don't think that in an innate response, you're going to, the body's going to, if you put light on you and you don't have a desire for neutrophils, there's not going to be extra neutrophils just because yeah. you put light on. I suspect uh, you know, the, you see, we, it's nice to have some romantic names like uh, the intelligence and the, frankly, it is so awesome. Biology is so awesome that uh, <laughs> you're probably right. So it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's showing some great respect for it to say that it has that. And, yeah, and I don't think it's probably unfair um, choice of words because it is awesome uh, what the immune system does and how it balances yeah, itself. Yeah. And as you know, we do this whole body treatment system. There's a couple of hundred of these things around the world where people are getting whole body treatments with us. And, and I use it pretty much every day. And I, as far as I can tell, it doesn't seem, it hasn't done me any harm yet over the last five years. So, no. So, but I'm being overcautious. Correct. Anyway. Preventing, so uh, particularly, so the, um, let's get into this thing. So the leading cause of death in COVID-19, uh, 
appears to be ARDS. Sometimes it seems to do other things to be catching up and overtaking. Multiple organ failure. People talk about this endotheliolitis uh, as well. I've even heard of uh, a, a form of arthritis being caused by, but people have brain issues, don't you? Heart issues. So, but anyway, in the early literature, it seemed that ARDS was the most challenging uh, effect of this in the severe cases. Uh, so this is what hospitalizes people when they start having breathing problems. Um, so this is an area where perhaps, you know, we can't, can we run around treating 7 billion people in the world with PBM just in case they might get COVID tomorrow? You know, it's probably impractical, but this is a point where intervention makes sense in hospitals. Um, and we obviously, everybody should have a healthy diet and things like that and try and keep themselves healthy so they are in the best shape for getting the virus and developing symptoms. But yeah, here we are, patients, hospitalized patients, they're severe patients um, at risk of developing ARDS. What might PBM uh, do for them? Uh, well, the turns out the leading markers uh, for critical cases are IL-6, this is a cytokine, IL-6 and TNF-alpha is another uh, cytokine. You might, people might have heard of the cytokine storm and C-reactive protein. Um, and IL-10. Well, it's IL-10 is actually an immunomodulatory or anti-inflammatory cytokine. So in a way, you really want more of that, and you want less of the others. And there's lots of others which are elevated in severe patients, but uh, in critical patients, it seems that IL-6, TNF-alpha, and CRP are, unique, are elevated further. They are distinctly the high markers for critical cases that uh, that have to end up in ICU, so uh, and maybe uh, IL one beta as well. I perhaps and some people would say as well uh, in there. And PBM has got a track record in multiple models of mouse models and animal model, uh, human models, and even some human clinical trials show reduced IL six CRP TNF alpha. Uh, IL-1 beta, and increased IL-10, which is what you want because uh, it helps uh, uh, sort of signal the other ones to go down. So there's plenty of evidence for that in, in, in studies, human and animal studies. So that's why you might want P a good time to have PBM. Uh, there have been mouse models of ARDS showing that PBM works and, uh, and again, reducing the cytokine storm uh, that leads to it. There are studies of uh, uh, COPD where uh, human patients are being treated, and it's animal studies as well, successfully. They're getting light into the lungs. And there's just some interesting cases of pneumonia, bacterial pneumonia, not ARDS, uh, not, not viral pneumonia, uh, where reports are not in controlled clinical trials, just case series saying that uh, how patients' uh, breathing is better, uh, reduced inflammation uh, in these patients. So uh, there's also asthma studies, and uh, I'm showing you just have to treat their bronchial tubes, and people have uh, breathing gets better. So those are all sort of indicators that perhaps PBM would make sense to be used in a hospital setting on, on patients who are developing severe uh, COVID symptoms and helping them not progress to uh, mechanical ventilation. Um, mechanical ventilation, this is um, not good. If you end up in ICU and mechanical ventilation, then I think the data is improving, the, the, the treatments are getting better. But uh, when I first was looking at that, you had like a 50% chance of coming out of ICU alive in the early days. It's improving. Can't recall you know, what, the, what the latest. I think, it's, I think it's improving from eighty percent to fifty percent. Right. So, um, but I did find this um, a study on uh, an experimental model of ventilator-induced lung injury. So this is protective ventilation versus um, whether using. So it shows here this is twenty-four rats into four different groups. You're going to get ninety minutes of ventilation. The tidal volume, as they refer to, these six milliliters per kilogram is apparently protective. Uh, the tidal volume where they cause an injury is, is basically overinflating them 
um, and over deflating them because you've got to leave some air in the lungs are going to 35 milligrams. So they deliberately over treat these rats so they develop a lung injury. So those are the four groups with or without PBM. So protective ventilation, protective ventilation with PBM, let's call it over ventilation for easy thing. So they develop a lung injury over ventilation with PBM. And the data is down here. I, this is what they've used conveniently all the all the cytokines I mentioned and there's chemokine here which is uh, which I didn't mention but IL-1 beta here you cannot even it's so small it's down here you can't even see the data this is the uh, amount of IL-1 beta if you just have normal uh, protective ventilation if you're with PBM on this dot here you can possibly see but if you cause a lung injury by overinflation here is the increase in the cytokine IL-1 beta uh, same story over here ventilation, ventilation with PBM, IL-6 is up, but down with PBM, so oh, sorry, we've got to say that here, IL-1 beta, IL-1 beta, so lung injury with PBM, it disappears, lung injury with PBM, IL-6 goes down, lung injury with PBM here, TNF-alpha goes down, uh, you can see it down over here as well in this chemokine as well, and over here on IL-10, so um, interestingly, it goes up here, and uh, the interesting thing here is about this is you want IL-10, uh, more IL-10 to help switch off the cytokine storm. So it's interesting that PBM seem to induce that uh, at this point here. I don't know why it isn't necessary down here. This is, oh, IL-10 is slightly elevated, that's right, right. good. And then that's, that's, and that's the, the model would show if that's significant or not. That's an, yeah. that's an excellent a representation of the positive aspects yes. of applying this because there are some it is injurious to these people it does create the, mm. a little bit of damage and that could be one of the things that accelerates the the inflammatory the recovery. storm yeah the inflammatory and the recovery too so yeah are you your IL tends down in your injury model but it's up in the PBM injured model that's good so you want it that way around in both these cases this is cool Thanks, absolutely one. So PBM, they say, reduced inflammatory response to an experimental lung injury model. Yeah, multiple studies like this. This just happened to be the, the one that included a ventilator, uh, which I thought would be useful in this part uh, of the presentation. So yeah, patients in ICU on uh, ventilation. Um, now, it's complicated in ICU. There's a lot of machinery around. Getting people treated is, uh, obviously, it's a lot of space. People have to get and a lot of PPE, um, it's, it's a difficult environment to do. You basically, preventing, prevention is better than cure. So mm. you don't want to be doing, you, if you, can, you can avoid PBM in here, you will. And that's um, an, uh, it's an August 2020 reference, so thank you for yeah, that. Yeah, that's diligence. right. Yeah, there's a few, a few uh, couple of weeks ago. Um, recovery, um, a lot of people who are familiar with PBM know that PBM has a, uh, there's over 60 studies looking at what light does to help athletes and people recover after exercise. It's well known. It's used by, I probably should have popped a slide in here showing all the American football, baseball, hockey, um, basketball teams that use PBM as part of the, their recovery after training. Uh, it was used by the Nike Oregon Project as well. Every Nike sponsored athlete in the middle and long distance running teams were required, were required to have whole body PBM three times a week. It is good for recovery. So there's some assumption that it ought to be good for uh, COVID patients, those who are struggling uh, with all sorts of uh, weaknesses and, and shortness of breath. PBM continues or could, could be used to have anti-inflammatory effects. It, PBM has an effect on TGF-BT and regulatory T cells, which have an effect on regenerative mechanisms. Uh, and it has a good history and plenty of data showing that PBM helps recovery after exercise. Maybe it would help here as well. Speculation, we need the, we need the data uh, for that. And of course, people want antibodies once they've got it. There's um, mixed data out in the world about whether or not people are making antibody, enough antibodies some paper papers showing believing they believe they say it is. I've seen con contradictory evidence saying it's not enough and it's not lasting. And I'm looking at up to the minute data. 
uh, there isn't a consistent agreement on this. Uh, I would probably bow to the view published in a journal like Nature rather than uh, the ones I haven't heard of, not that I'm an expert in um, uh, immunology, so I don't know which the journals are, but looking at the journal Nature and, and, the, and things like The Lancet, then there are still question marks hanging over whether or not we're making enough antibodies and that whether or not they're lasting enough. What have we got? Nothing directly, but I do have something interesting uh, for you. And that is that it seems to increase the motility of antigen presenting cells in a, after, uh, after a vaccine injection. So a lot of people are concerned that even if we have a vaccine or when we have a vaccine, there's going to be lots of vaccines, aren't there? They're, they're coming thick and fast now. Um, that PBM combined uh, with the administration of a vaccine uh, seems to improve these uh, uh, antigen presenting cells. So it's applied to the skin at the site of the injection. Um, this study reports that it had increased antigen uptake at the site of the vaccine, uh, accelerated motility uh, of the antigen presenting cells to the lymph nodes, so transporting to the lymph nodes there. Um, a few local or systemic side effects. And this is in um, this is in a oh this is a, a mouse study, but they've oh is it humans or mouse? <gasps> I've forgotten. I could look that up uh, in a minute. Um, no, this is humans. Yes. So um, um, yeah. So they conclude that PBM augments humoral and cell mediated, mediated immune responses, and it's risk free, has distinct advantage over traditional uh, vaccine uh, adjuncts as well. So that's interesting, could help our vaccines. If it works to help a vaccine, does it might it also help as part of your, uh, your adaptive immune system? So adaptive meaning after you've uh, had an infection, your, adaptive, your innate immune system, so it's seeing your adaptive immune system kicks in and maybe we're helping, maybe? I mean, why not? I don't know. Um, so maybe, that'd be interesting. Um, Oh, there is something else uh, I want to mention. Um, a, 50, a report of a COVID patient in a hospital treated uh, with PBM. 57-year-old, African-American, with severe COVID-19, was treated four times, or once a day uh, for four days, uh, treating over his lungs, uh, over his back, so posterior, um, with a mixture of uh, 808 nanometers and 905 nanometer pulsed laser. Though when you look at it, and I'm gonna show you some data in a moment on the, on the parameters, there was one and a half watts of 808 and there was 35 milliwatts of 905. So in comparison, it seems like the, the, the 808 nanometer was doing all the work really. That's 1,500 milliwatts versus 33 milliwatts of the other one. So mostly, by a long way, mostly 808 nanometers, treated for nearly half an hour, 28 minutes. Uh, you'll see why, because it was a scanning laser that covered quite a large area. Uh, I probably should have showed, I haven't provided, um, put the lung edema slides, but you can see in the, um, uh, in the x-rays that there is less lung edema in the uh, afterwards rather than before, and they take, do all sorts of pulmonary severity indices, blood tests, looking at oxygen requirements, so oxygen saturation increased from 33, 93 to 94, up to 97, and up to 100%. Uh, we had uh, our own patients um, who, say we, our own, uh, owners of our product, reported them, they were down to, one of them, there was a couple, 92 and 94%, they were down at home, really didn't want to go to hospital, started using our whole body treatment system and got themselves, pretty much, pretty much identical story, I think, they were saying 97 to 100%, though it didn't, though it does come back, it's not like a once off and it comes back and then I might caution against, just because somebody looks like they're better for a, a, a day, don't discharge them because they might need treatment again, mm -hmm. as a little thought, because uh, fortunately these people, this couple had, because uh, they got it in their house, were able to, keep coming back to it. Um, 
And as a, as, as a side note, uh, Sohilia Makmeli, uh, the author of this and two other papers, will be presenting at the summit. So they'll be in, she's going to talk about her experience okay, and how good. she got that done out in Canada. And you should also note in the summit that uh, Cocos had a, an early case series of four people with very similar results. And it was about five, four to five days for recovery for their mm. oxygen saturation to go up. Yep. And I, I'm not sure how many treatments they, they, they actually uh, gave this, uh, in this, this, uh, this man in the case series. It's for, uh, so this study here, it's four treatments, four mm. daily treatments. And that was it, four days, and that, that yeah. seems to be like what uh, they're saying is that yes it it, uh, it it chimes with what we've heard from the couple that you, the whole body thing and i know a vascular surgeon who was already a, a user of our product using it himself um he didn't have any data to go with them and at least our folks had the presence of mind to check their oxygen saturation and in this study here they're saying that uh, the requirement for oxygen reduced from two to four uh, liters per minute to one liter per minute and so substantial improvement in the community inquired pneumonia assessment tool, apparently. And uh, oh, there's a picture of where they were treating. So this is the back of the patient there. It wasn't a solid lump like this. As you can see it's actually a scanning laser beam which kind of moves around up and down to cover the whole area. So it's actually three beams and I I think it might rotate and I think it moves up and down a little bit like this if you can see my mouse pointer here correct and then we're doing it on both sides there uh, and they're covering this 10 by 25 centimeter area so 250 square centimeters with one and a half watts of 808 laser um, and I will bring up the uh, the, the the data just because it's my favorite topic this correct is this is what makes me happy. Well, except that it's not correct. That's the problem. Well, um, let's, it's, they've got, it, that is, it, it's, it, of course, there's parameters that are, that are, there's, I, I'll, I'll take a screenshot. There's, yes, sir. that's so, why uh, I work with a medical physicist because I know <laughs> James Carroll's going to look at my stuff. So, <laughs> oh, it's cruel. It's, 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 you know, it's a, it's a ner it's an unfamiliar nerdy topic that people are just not used to. And I, I, I no longer think badly of people. I know it's confusing. Look, you take me into your, your world, whoever you, your profession is, and ask me to write a paper on something, and I'm going to make mistakes. Of course I am. Uh, I, I think about these things all the time. Uh, so there's a bit of, I think somebody's, I cannot make sense of this pulse regime here. Uh, one hertz divided by two kilohertz. Huh? Okay, whatever that's about on these two sides. This is the 808 and this is the 905. I, you don't norm, I doubt that was pulsed like that. This would be quite a common pulse regime. I think this is two, this wasn't two kilohertz. This was um, 200 nanoseconds, that would have been. And that may well be, oh, that's one kilohertz. Oh no, I don't know, that doesn't make any sense. Forget it, anyway, it's not, it's, it's there's mistakes in there okay. uh, somewhere. And I calculate the uh, the average power, uh, then I get to 1.5 uh, watts here plus the 30 thing there's 1.533 watts. See, the 33 milliwatts is 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 irrelevant almost. It's so small by comparison to 1,500 milliwatts over here. Mm. Spot size is reported as 19 centimeters per centimeter squared on the beam. Well, that's the triangle, I think. It's going to, there's the, the beam there. But the thing is, the beam's not standing still. It's covering a whole area over 28 minutes. So the irradiated area, my view, is when you're, you've got a scanning technique and that device is a built-in uh, electronic um, motorized scanner, moves it up and down. This is not relevant. What's relevant is the area. They should have used this number here, the 25 centimeters squared. So instead of um, 65.5 joules per centimeter squared, oh, by the way, they call it 7.1 to 7.2 joules per centimeter squared. No, it's 65. Um, and I should have drawn the arrow from there. Um, so no, not seven. It's actually, and when I divide that power by this area, it's actually 5.1 joules per centimeter squared is my calculation anyway what would um, be that distance from the skin i mean a lot of people uh, you use uh, distant panels some yep. people are scanning and things like yep. that now yeah what is that due to all right so we have a 
calculated the power, but that distance is going to reduce a lot of things. How well, do you calculate that? Let me answer. There's, there's, there's two possible things people might be thinking of. Is First of all, uh, most people who are new to lasers would imagine that laser beams are collimated, and that means that they go in a straight line, like a pencil. And mostly in photobiomodulation, they're not collimated, they are divergent. So that means that beam is like kind of like that, going away from it. And in, uh, mostly they are divergent. But this product here uh, appears to be a collimated beam that's moved around a lot. So the beam profile is that leaves the actual head, arrives at the same size on the patient's body. So distance, the patient could be on the moon and it wouldn't make any difference. Oh. Okay. So uh, that's what it probably would do because there's all sorts of things that would scatter the light you know, in the atmosphere. But, uh, you know, just for the sake of humor. Uh, yeah, you could treat a patient on the moon with a collimated laser. Uh, so uh, that is okay. And then they move it around a lot such that it covers these 250 centimeters squared so you take the total power divided by the total area that was treated and it comes out 5.1 joules, joules per centimeter squared. There we go. And they receive, by my calculation, uh, 1,288 joules in total energy. Um, how does life. that compare, just to, 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 for Joe the plumber, <clears throat> what, how does that compare with, let's say, uh, uh, 1200 and they said 17, 1800. So I mean, they, they, they made a thing, but what is that uh, compared to like the authority table? You know, a, oh, a whole body um, God. you'd think I would know off the top of my head, it's that one for that one. So that's, uh, uh, I need to make a quick calculator out because I, I always remember the one for the small one and now everybody's got the big one. Um, I can just press the calculator and it was four, eight, zero, and divide by six times uh, seven. Okay. Yeah, now it was 560,000 milliwatts. Oh, right. So I knew there would be exponentially more. Yes. So 500,000. If, if you do 20 milliwatts, because if you, sorry, if you do, um, if you were to do 20 minutes yeah. in terms of joules, that's, 67,000, 672,000 joules uh, of energy. Over a larger part, but over a larger surface yes, area. Yes, over a whole area. It so wouldn't be absorbing the, all of it. It's a, lot of, it's a lot of juice. And, and so they were able to accomplish this with... Uh, small know, amount of light. Small a lot of light. Yeah. Yes. Let me just make sure I did that right. I'm going to do 480 times... Uh, oh, divided by... Six times seven to get that large one equals which times twenty minutes, which has been multiplied by sixty to get to seconds. Yeah, six seven. That's a lot, isn't it? Six hundred seventy-two thousand joules of, of energy being emitted. Of course, your body doesn't cover the whole thing. Uh, but actually, as the joules per centimeter squared, it's considerably less because if you do joules for each centimeter squared of the body, uh, it's be point oh two eight times. Uh, 20 times 60 seconds, uh, 33 joules per centimeter squared, which is but quite a lot. you're also front and you're, you're front and back, doing both, front doing and both back. So simultaneously. Good. So the whole body all at once, 33 joules, 33 point joules per centimeter squared for That's a 20 so minute frame. Lovely. Which oh. is not, which is no longer excessive, is it? So, nope. so and it, it, it's funny you kind of bring that subject up because uh, there's another thing. To another, tell you. another, another thing? Yeah, and another thing. Um, wait, wait, let me, and just, that let is, me just say this. Now for something completely different. Go ahead. <laughs> That's very English of you. Yeah. You obviously multi Python fan. Huh. So, uh, so uh, the Biomedical Advanced Research Development Authority, BADA, in the United States, is funding all sorts of uh, uh, therapies for uh, for COVID nineteen. Uh, and so we are, uh, we've been speaking with them. They've, uh, they like the sound of PBM as a treatment for COVID patients. Uh, we've collaborated uh, with Praveen at Buffalo University. Uh, they've written, a, they've designed a trial. We've designed a product specifically for the hospital. Um, looks like that. So it's a single-sided 
uh, device that goes over a hospital bed because it's difficult to get patients out of bed. Uh, and so it treats them like that. Uh, and uh, we've uh, been through the first stage of FDA with them uh, to approve the trial design. Um, so one of the things they're interested in is uh, that we do a clinical trial that uh, if, assuming the photobiomodulation is successful, uh, that, that we've designed or Praveen's university has designed a trial that if proven to be successful is sufficiently powered, so it's 902 patients, probably across, I don't know, probably uh, 10 hospitals or something, um, and that if it really does produce the results, it's probably powered, they've got, the, they've got approved outcome, primary outcome measures, um, and uh, the product uh, we've got through phase one with the FDA, we've got to go through another phase where we have to go to a meeting with them. If they like that, then we go back to BARDA and say, FDA have blessed the trial design, and then uh, we then try to get BARDA, who was, uh, was keen to, do, to fund it, to actually fund a very large uh, multi center clinical trial with PBM. So that's where we're at. We're in phase one or three of on, on the journey to, to getting Magnificent, funded. magnificent. And, and as a, the, the, that's just great work. Uh, that's just great work. Now, remember that the, the COVID summit is available for people for free to watch. And if any of those BARDA hotshots want to <laughs> look at some of the evidence, we've got a bunch. We will be doing that. There's a meeting that we will be going to. If, if we get through round two with the FDA, then, we're, then we'll be going to uh, BADA, and yeah, we'll be using this and other data. Uh, but we've focused our minds on hospitalized patients uh, because it's not practical to treat 7 billion people and hopefully boost their innate system uh, every day of the week in the, in the event that they might bump into a virus. Not practical. I think it's not practical in ICU, you know, better to treat people before they've had COVID, before they're in recovery. Prevention's better than cure. Um, so uh, we are, well, prevention of the virus is unrealistic, but preventing people, severe patients becoming critical is what we've decided to go for in this. Wonderful. 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 So um, that's where I say, um, Oh, this, this is our, we actually, this is the first people treating the back of the lungs. We have uh, treated people on the back of the lungs before uh, with these giant laser cluster probes. There's 80 lasers in each of those delivering 200 milliwatts each. So 16 watts of light each. Uh, each. Treating the back. Yeah, 16 watts. So pretty much it's funny. When we saw those two drawings, we thought, hey, isn't that our product? <laughs> uh, so there we go on that thing. And what we've got over here. Yeah, and then of course, what our other friends were using was uh, our customers were using this uh, whole body treatment system. And I would also point out uh, that I believe it was Lisa Loxo who pointed, who did her uh, COVID talk on the sepsis, because right. e even at the end, yes. if you have yes. co continuous fibrosis and you get millions of people, that's going to be a de the disability. That's that's yes. Oh, the long-term the long-term effects of COVID um, could be considerable. That's also the neurodegenerative effects, as we talked about. You know, yep. that's something that's going to be coming into after they get them out and they're mobile and they're outside the hospital, and then the, you see the increased incidence of of c cognitive decline. Yeah. Anything so, else you want to add? Oh, there it's all bright. Hello. Oh, there it is lit up now, yeah. Uh, no, um, this is normally uh, where I say um, 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 uh, you, uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you all for going. You may now clap your hands, which I do here. There we go. Yay. Yay. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> and then finally, uh, another Now my wife's expecting me home for dinner now. <laughs> Thank you.